take us to uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 13. This was the, I wasn't planning to start here, although I start here every day. So I'm, it's not these exact verses, but this exact pattern. And I do believe it's very important for us advancing together into the maturity of the church that, that Father has promised Jesus. Uh, he's going to have a, a matured bride, a perfect man one who's come into the measure of the fullness of the Christ. So that's what we're being brought into. And sometimes that feels like it'll never happen. Sometimes it feels like all it is is testings and trials. Sometimes it seems like so long the delay. What, but we have Jesus as our prime follower, and we have Abraham as the father of the faith that began following the Lord in that except believing that he could do. So I'd like to begin in verse 13. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to pray first and enter into the place that I come to find is true, no matter where things are and no matter how things are going, and to which I, the more I honor the Father in this, the more the Father steps into the situation I'm in and makes himself even more real. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the provision of your son, Jesus Christ. The most perfect gift, God the Son became son of man, submitted himself to the Father, fully, fully, humbly, willingly, to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you were willing to place your son as my sin and put upon him my judgment and your wrath and all that would come of my sin, sickness, disease, distress, destruction. And you fully exhausted yourself upon that to make things right. Jesus, I'm forever grateful that upon the night of your betrayal in the garden, when you came to the end of this life and presented yourself to the Father, you believed God would raise you from the dead. You invoked the Abraham faith, but it wasn't his faith this time. It was your faith. Not the father believing the son would come out of the ashes, but it was the son believing the father would pull him out of death. And so your faith was heard. and You died. The father called you forth from the dead. And when he called you forth out of the abyss, he said, you are my son today. I've begotten you. And you were brought out of the grave with a new resurrected body. Now you are seated at the right hand of God the Father. You are my intercessor, my high priest. But everything is in you. There is not a thing that I need that has not been provided in Christ through my Father. My Father made promise, and Christ is the fulfillment of the promise, and Holy Spirit is the manifestation of the promise fulfilled. And I praise you. So, Lord, I bring to you today my struggles and troubles, and I will not diminish the great and glorious name of Jesus. But I say that in Christ is everything that is needed. And I say that, Father, you are able to perform your promises. There's not a promise that's been made, whispered in my heart or whispered into any heart, that you have not already committed yourself to the fulfillment of such. We are pilgrims. We're traveling through earth. We have vision of a city whose builder, maker is God. You're not ashamed to call us your brethren. You're not ashamed to call be our God. We praise you. We praise you. Would you help us this morning? Would you realign us, align us? Would you activate and bring us back into faith? Would you release the love that God has and we are to have and to enjoy and to share and to give away and when you activate our life and our gifting and our movement forward. We ask you to do this for your glorious namesake. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the promise, now we're speaking of Abraham, that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It's so important because we will always in the law find ourselves in sin and shortcoming. And if we try to employ more law, the further we go, it's like going into a rabbit hole. We'll never get out. For if those who are of the law are heirs and faith is made void, the promise made of no effect, 
because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law there is no transgression therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace everything that's coming into our life is grace it's the provision of God through the Son and the Spirit bringing it. Oh, it's by faith according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So this is with the Jew and Gentile made into one new man, new creation. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Now, in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. May we pause for just a moment. Consider this pattern of life and this pattern really of prayer. In fact, that reminds me, men, we're meeting at 7.30 this Saturday in the cafe for breakfast, 8 o'clock in the sanctuary. We'll go till 9.30. We're addressing inheritance and how to step further in or to partner with what Abraham observed in the full spectrum of his life. It's, I think it's going to be important, so I hope you can all come bring your friends. It goes 7.30 till 9.30. So Abraham is in the presence of him whom we believe. That's what prayer does. It brings us into the presence of him whom we believe. His presence is always with us, but we're not always aware of his presence. But when we become aware of his presence, then we begin to have the opportunity to hear his voice in a way we might not hear his voice if we're not aware of his presence. So in the things of the kingdom, whether reading the Bible or praying or the Holy Spirit, they all work in concert and they bring a testimony over an experience which can be both seen and heard. Does that make sense? You see the Lord and you hear his voice. You hear, you, you hear the Lord and see his voice. It's, he's just, for instance, I've just been wanting to tell you this. How many of you are reading Ezekiel after you've read Jeremiah? Is that? Jeremiah has a 41-year ministry from the time he's called to be a prophet till the day Jerusalem is taken and over by Nebuchadnezzar completely. And Zechariah, his eyes are put out and sent off to Babylon. And he continues a little longer. Ezekiel comes into the prophetic ministry in visions six years prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. So Jeremiah has been prophesying 35 years, and he was basic. I, I like to think of him as God's a mediator trying to save a marriage. He tr pleading and pleading and pleading and pleading and pleading with Israel to, relate, to remove themselves from idolatry and, and back to, into kindness and, and justice and to no avail. But by the time Ezekiel's come in, even correlating with Jeremiah, they're basically, they're just like Jeremiah, Ezekiel lives in Babylon, Jeremiah lives in Jerusalem. And God's just like saying, okay, I need you, Ezekiel, to start doing, agreeing with what I want to say, and it's all about Jerusalem. I, I was telling Cam, I don't, I don't want to, you know, uh, despair anybody or get, give, you know, give light to my old past before Christ, but Ezekiel is like reading Jeremiah on LSD. It's like, it's like, wow, what, whoa, wow. And yet it's all of the heart of God and his jealousy toward us. And if we read, we read Ten Commandments last week, it's the second commandment. God makes a confession. He's very honest about it. He says, don't make any graven images. Don't make any idols. Don't make anything to resemble me but in heaven you saw or on earth or under the earth because I am a jealous God. Just, he's just right up the front. I, I, have an is, I have a jealousy issue. So this God 
who's wanting all of our attention is in a transformation journey with us in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is the only provision to which we get to know love, acceptance, joy, pleasure, victory, purpose. It's all in Christ. So when I'm reading Ezekiel and I'm watching it and I'm and it just keeps going because I'm up to like 21. What I'll do is I'll listen. If we're in a book that's like that, I'll just listen to it over and over again when I drive so I can just kind of get inundated with the storyline. And it's, it's just it's amazing because everything in the Bible is to lead me to Jesus Christ. Everything is to point out who I am as mankind and what God has provided for us and Christ and all of the uh, op flip-flops man chooses in his efforts to be what God told him to be, which he could never be because he doesn't have the ability to be because our flesh is weak. So Abraham is our picture of that. He's 99 years old, and God now shows up and says, I've made you a father of many nations, and he's been believing that he's going to be a father, and in fact, he is a father, and Ishmael is his son. And now God's saying, nope, I'm going to have a covenant with you. I'm changing your name changing your wife's name. I want you to circumcise yourself and every male in your house. And Abram is just like in a one year super quick changeover. And I think that's the part that's always hard to wait for because when the suddenly comes, it took a long time to get there. So it says of Abram, God gives life to the dead, and he calls those things that don't exist. That's the joy of prayer, isn't it? When you get some time with them, next thing you know, you don't feel dead. And you start to actually think things you can't see are really real, are true, and will happen. And that's the, the, the place in the spirit. That's how Ezekiel could move in visions. He's told in one vision, I want you to go to prophesy to... Uh, to these uh, two men in Jerusalem. And while he's prophesying in Babylon, one man dies. And he freaks out. I mean, like, God, please, I'm not really wanting this to happen. But it's the movement of the Spirit. And he's there. And now God's saying, oh, it's time. It's now. You're going to have a kid. His name's Isaac. And it says, who contrary in hope. So he had a hope when he first started that now is no longer the hope that God is having him embrace or consider or try to, try to bring about. He's saying, nope, you're... Because you're. Abraham's first prayer in that encounter in, Revel, in Genesis 17 is let Ishmael stand before you. Just let Ishmael be the promised child. He says, no. He was flesh. He was contriving. He was your own efforts. He was you working your thing out. But he, he would be a great nation. Twelve princes will come out of him. But in Isaac, my name will be known. So it says he's in this moment. Well, do I keep going with you? It's always, a, you know, from the smallest of increments of prayer to the life-changing moments in prayer where we have to let go of something that we've been trying to resurrect ourselves or save in some way. And we have to, and God starts speaking, and it's like, I got to let go of this to go into that. That's what he did. He let go of the old, and he stepped into the new, the hope he believed. And he became, so he could become the father of many nations, according to what was spoken. So promises are changing us and partaking up with, uh, giving us the opportunity to be partakers of his nature. So he says he would, he would become the father of many nations just according to what was spoken. God the Father spoke it. Now he's going to become it. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith. So he's not weak in faith. He's like, oh, wow. Who? Hmm. I was one thing to believe this when I was 75. Now I'm 99. So first thing he does is he takes a quick inventory, which we all have to. Not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So consider, he did not consider. The word consider means to, uh, to, con to consider fully, to really look at it, to really look at it, 
to go get his medical reports, his checkups, you know, to, to see, like a Zechariah moment, when Zechariah, when, when the angel Gabriel says, you're going to have a, a baby, and we're going to name him John. And he said, well, how can this possibly be? Because I am old and my wife's barren. Well, Abram's in the same place. Abraham, he's changed his name. And so it says, he didn't consider. So there's faith moments, like what we felt in the worship. There's this continually opportunity that we're learning to accept. You're telling me to, to step into something I cannot touch and cannot force and cannot prove, but it's real, it's true, it's you. And it's always Holy Spirit, Word of God. And they're always flowing and together. And so it, he didn't look at Sarah's womb, but he, and he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. The word waver, Old King James, stagger, means to separate thoroughly. So there's things that I can look at so long that are death that it is immovable. It's a mountain. And then there's promises that God's speaking that I can dissect so much that they have no life in them. And then I can't possibly allow that thing to happen because the, I don't get it. It's, I've got troubles and struggles. I got an offense. I got a process. I don't know. Lots of things. But Abraham, Abraham had a big thing. Abraham had to go through a major trauma having brought a revelation of God to Sarai 13 years earlier. And... The, the promise made to him, which was you out of your seed, there will be stars of heaven. And Sarah, I had to say, you know what? I can't produce, so we're going to have to come up with another way to bring this promise forward. That brought a lot of strife into their family and a lot of distress. And now he's having to step into the promise has become clearer and more uh, precise. It's Sarah who's going to have the baby, Sarah. Now, Abraham has learned one thing. Don't tell your wife what God told you. Let God tell your wife what he told you. Wait for the other party to come into agreement. Don't project. Does that make sense? And you know the story. God makes a personal stop at Abraham's house, at his tent. And while the the meal is being prepared, the Lord says, hey, is Sarah around? Oh, yes, she's in the tent. Well, by this time next year, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i be coming by, and she'll have a baby. And Sarah starts laughing. And she could, somebody so old, it's me, going to have a child and bring joy. And the Lord says, why did you laugh? And she freaks out like all of us would. I didn't laugh. And next thing you know, he said, yeah, you did, but it will happen. That has always given me a lot of courage that there are times when I lose my place and God says, yeah, you did, but who cares? It's not about you. It's not by your ability. In fact, that year that Abraham comes into promise is probably the most upheaval year of his life that I can tell by reading the narrative. It goes from about Genesis 17 to 22, 23. Because as they finish their meal and, and the Lord and the two angels are leaving and Sarah's pick cleaning up, they, the Lord says to the angels, should I keep from Abraham what I'm about to do? Because I've come to know him so he can lead his children. I want him a part of the process. So he says to Abram, Abraham, I'm uh, coming down to check Sodom and Gomorrah. The cry has gotten, come up to heaven of its wickedness and such. And I've come to find out if it's true. Now Abraham, this is, knows that his nephew Lot is living there with at least four daughters. And he's had a charge given to him probably from his father because Lot is a nephew of his or cousin. It's, he's part of the family and he's been caring for him and rescuing him and taking care of him and providing for him. And now all of a sudden he's going, oh no. Be like you hearing the story of God said, I'm going to destroy Los Angeles. 
and you've got loved ones in Los Angeles, and you're trying to think, how do I save my loved ones? Or so Abram does this fanciful negotiations, inter, you know, intercession negotiation. How about 50? If there's 50 righteous people, we destroy the city. No, I won't. 40, 30, 20. Okay, I'll ask one more time. 10. I won't destroy it. In my heart, I imagine that Abraham trusted that Lot's family would be enough to save the city. He had at least four daughters because there's two that are virgins, and there's two that are, at least two because there's more than one that, uh, that are married that they try to persuade uh, the families to leave and get out of the city once the angels are there. In any case, as a heart of an intercessor, with a charge to take care of his son, or his nephew, the next morning, Abram gets up and he looks over. Where he lives is on the Negev. It's above where, where Sodom and Gomorrah would be, down in the valley. And he sees this plume of, of burning earth, like, like a nuclear bomb had gone off. And he realizes at that moment, it didn't work. Intercession failed. What I, my objective failed. And it sets a, a kind of a, a panic that shouldn't have been there, but it was there. Uh, isn't most panics just panics? Later on, you look, oh, no, I wish I wouldn't have got so... But he gets, he says, comes home, Sarah, we're leaving. Pack it up. We're leaving. Get all 200 and plus servants. We're moving this whole, this, this is an unsafe place. I want to go to some place really safe. Now think of present day Israel. I'm going to go, let's go camp in Gaza. Do you know where Gaza is? It's the same Gaza. It's the same land. And it's a different kingdom. Abimelech is the king. And so he's, he's now got there, and now he's got a problem that was always his problem. He's got a beautiful wife, and he doesn't know how to really process that and protect this. So he's kind of had a plan that's always worked. It says, listen, if anybody asks of you, or who are you? Are you my husband? No, say he's my brother. So they won't kill me on your sake. So he's just following backwards into patterns that we would hope we were all grown up out of. But it doesn't matter because that happens. Sarah is in Abimelech's harem. He's ready to get, wants to marry her. And God wakes him up in the middle of the night and says, you're a dead man. And he says, why am I a dead man? He says, because you've got another man's wife. He said, well, didn't she, he say she was a brother? And she said he was his brother? And yeah, but you're still a dead man if you don't return him. See, the beautiful thing about God is it's by grace through faith and not by works of law. And when it comes time for God's purpose to be fulfilled in us, it will be fulfilled through us because of Jesus Christ. And we may be in a crisis. Somebody prayed that earlier. You don't, does not, we, uh, Val's saying it. It does not matter where we are. It matters where Christ is. It matters what God said. It matters what he's bringing forth. And when, so Abraham is restored. Sarah's given a, quite a lot of, 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 of restoration wealth. And they're off to, to come into the promise. And so he is now, and I think, he, I think this is why this means so much, it says, he glorified God, not being weak in faith. Can you go back, Val? Or, or, go back, not Val. Barb. Barb and Val. Val and Barb. He did not waver. He did not stagger. He did not take apart the promise. How can this happen now? I'm too old. Oh, no. Sarah's in, in, in Bimlik's house. How did I do that? Oh, no. I ran away. Oh, no. Lot's dead. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's, it would look like a terrible oh, no's. And yet something was larger than that like a seed bursting forth out of the ground, or like God commanding light to shine out of darkness, or life to rise out of death. Jesus believed God would raise him from out of the death, not to avoid the death. And we all want to avoid the death, but there's some deaths that have come upon us we could not avoid, have they? There are things that have landed on your life that you wish you'd never, you never dreamed it on you. You've hoped it, you've tried to fight against it, tried to rescue it from it, but you've had to now just settle in. Here it is. 
But now that's when God starts speaking. And he starts saying, now. I'm doing it now, now. And so what does he do? He's, he doesn't dissect the promise through the unbelief. I can't believe this anymore. It's too much. This is too radical. This is too much. And you're telling me every day I'm supposed to wake up and believe God's real and loves me and was going to answer the promise and fulfill his purpose? Yes, but that's too hard. My soul's torn. She so said, but he was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. A phrase that can be very powerful, helps me continually, is that I say to my Father, Heavenly Father, I believe and I am convinced that you are able to perform what you promised. You are able to perform what you promised. Which is the next verse. Being fully convinced that he was able to perform what he's promised. The word fully convinced is, is to wear something, like putting yourself in a garment, like putting a coat on. Okay, I've got to put on my coat of fully convinced. I'm fully convinced. What am I convinced of? That what God promised, he can perform. It's not for me to perform what he promised, and what I do in failure is not going to undo what he will perform and promise, because the promise is fulfilled by grace and not by works. It's not by merit. I, I think, God, I, I, I don't think. I thank you, Father that you let Abraham act out Abraham in the Bible so I could see that you are not limited by me acting out me. Does that make sense? All it takes is connection in the presence of him who's calling something that doesn't exist as though it does. Not look at what we're in and and separate and separate and, and consider it and take the promise, but say, give God glory and be fully convinced. You're able. You're able. You're able. You're able. It's a good word. Lord, you're able to get me out of this. Lord, you're able to deliver me. Lord, you're able to fulfill what you spoke in my life. Lord, you're able. You're able. Father, you're able. God the Father makes the promise. Jesus fulfilled all promises. He's the yes and the amen. Holy Spirit brings the manifestation. It's not about us, except that it comes through us. And God the Father gets all the glory through us because of the Son. And we're about to have channels of blessing break through. Channels of, of outcomes and victories that God wants to show himself strong and beautiful. Yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Of course we don't merit it, but God will perform it. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So God says, you, you, you rose above your failures. You rose above other people's failures. You rose above your age limitations and Sarah's limitations. And you rose above all the conflict and confusion. And you just came above and said, you glorified me that I was able to perform what I promised. That is righteousness. It will forever be righteousness. This is what I call righteousness. One who will believe my words that I am able to perform, that I am faithful, I am able. And so it was written not for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him. Who's the him? Father, God, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Jesus did not raise himself from the dead. He did not huff and puff and get himself out of hell. He was the yielded one, believing in the Father's faithfulness, ability, and he, the Father, raised him from the dead. And it says that is the reason we are made righteous, that we believe the Father raised Jesus from the dead. We're starting to see a pattern here, aren't we? God brings forth promise out of death, out of the loss, out of the opportunity that we saw that made so much sense that it was going to happen this way. We all do that. I do that. It's natural to have an, a plan or to see a, a, a way it could be. We have the essence, but we don't have the details. And when, when the details land on us, they condemn us. And we feel hopeless, discouraged, and we... And yet, God's just saying, watch this, watch this. And he was delivered. Jesus was delivered because of our offenses. And he was raised because of our justification. So literally, 
The reason Jesus came out of the grave was because every one of us had been now destined to come out of the grave. Every one of us had been given the resurrection to life. So however dead we are, there's a life ready to raise. There's a life that's ready to be raised. There's a life that's ready to be raised. It's, it's, and it's, it's not, it's, it's got to be nurtured in your own and my own, our own prayer times. That's why praise right now, we've been saying it for at least three months. Praise is really important and get loud, get large and get big. Make God big, make God big, make God big. There are times my soul will get so overwhelmed with the limitations that I'm facing or the problems that I'm regretting or the troubles that I'm struggling with and they become many and you feel them. Impossibility of this, impossibility of that. What do I do here? How do I carry that? And there are times that I need to just stop and tell the Lord exactly how, where I am. I just, you need to know where I am. And there are but I learned years ago that I don't end there. I tell, I, by the time I finish telling God where I am, I remind myself of where he is. And I call him faithful, call him able, call him good, call his supply, his victory. Now, lately, because I feel a maturing is happening in my life, a little bit, it's just a baby maturing. I am learning that there's some things I don't need to question anymore. Are you good? Are you faithful? Are you capable? Are you able? Though the pressure still comes. You know what I'm saying? Like we're going to read Joshua in two weeks. And Joshua gets the first victory of Jericho. And because there's a hidden sin that no one else is aware of, when they go off to take the next city, they're, just, they're, 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 they're defeated. And Joshua, not knowing that what's the real issue at hand, he assumes and he falls apart like all of Israel has for the last 40 years and said, oh God, are you brought me here to kill us? It's just human nature. And no matter how trained you are, no matter how much a warrior you are, you can fall apart. The best of us just fall apart. But God will come to us when we fell apart. That's Jesus' intercession. And to say, as he said to Joshua, he said, just get up. There's, there's sin in the camp. Let's deal with that, and we'll get going back into my plan. He's always calling us forward. He's calling life out of death. So if you're going to have the life, the Zoe life, you're going to have to experience the death in life. And that's so counterintuitive. And it makes no sense how we are supposed to go there. I want to show a couple verses for communion that I think are really important, and it, it makes it very simple. If we go to Romans 12, we're in Romans right now. In verse 12, he says, I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, chapter, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. The one place I'm supposed to take to God constantly is me. And if I don't bring me to God, and especially my body, which is what's the just manageable thing that wants to fall apart, go this direction, is it just bring it, so submit it, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. It's your reasonable. It's reasonable to do this. And don't be conformed to this world, which is the world thought, the world's way, this whole lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, lust of the, uh, the pride of life, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's the second part of me. I have an outer body and an inner man. My outer body is my body and my soul, and it is very impacted by the world I live in. It, 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 it gets all its information from the outside. And you can't, and it will I'll be conformed again and again back to the world, to its negativity, to its defeat, to its uh, prejudice, to its anger, to its hostility, whatever. I will just be absorbed in it. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the mind has to be the thought. The, what I put my thought on has to be applied 
to the word, to the truth of God, that I can prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's an everyday journey. That's just an everyday journey. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's our battle, primarily, in so many ways, is pride. Self-resource. I can do this. I'm able to do this. I need to do this. I'm going to do this. Don't think more highly of yourself. But think soberly. As God has dealt to each a measure of faith. So we've been given a measure of faith. We don't have to try to puff ourselves up to have more. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So this is, this is where we, we start to break apart because we are all in one body, but we're all many members. And we don't have the same function. So we're not on the same, we don't function the same. Even though we're all in this room, we all call upon the name of the Lord. We have a sense of the same tribe, same sense of purpose, but we are unique in the way we express it and are called to be functional as a body member. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So when we think of destiny and inheritance, we are being brought into this one body, many members. And if you'll stay, you know, note there, and we'll come right back. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, 12, 12, 12, I think it is. I, this is important. I wrote this this morning. Isn't it funny that the measure of our faith is in our love for one another? God speaks to us of grand and big, powerful things that we have to say yes to, yes to, yes to, yes to. Then he puts awful people in our way that we have to love. Puts us in marriages that aren't that easy to work with. He puts us, denies us things that our does our soul has craved for all of its life. And then we learn how to love, which means we learn how to forgive. That we're to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. And that's the love walk, faith and love. My faith is measured by my love, or in my love. And when we have really struggling time, God will often say, eyes off self, eyes on Jesus, serve others. Eyes off self, eyes on Jesus, serve others. So he says, we're uh, one body, many members, but all members of that one body, being many, are one body, but so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. We are, there's only one body of Christ. And we are all baptized by the Spirit of God into that body. And when we were placed inside the body of Christ, we were placed by the Father's predetermined plan of who we were to be inside the body of Christ. Whether we are Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So there's only one plan of God, one Spirit. For, in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Which we can all feel that, you know, every, everything's about, you know, the hand. Everything, it's all about hands now. And I'm a foot. And, uh, I wish I wasn't a foot. And we tend, to not, we tend to think we don't want to be what we are. That's one of the ways you can tell what you are, is you're trying not to be that. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye... Am I not of the body? Is, is, um, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? So he's letting us, by using our own body that we're living inside, see the picture of the body of Christ. There's only one head, that's Jesus Christ. The rest of us are members of the body connected to the head. But now God has set members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. We don't get a vote. We are placed by his pleasure. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. 
and the eye cannot say to the hand. Now we're going the reverse. One is like, I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel good enough. I feel like I, it's negative pride, where I th I'm thinking too much about myself, but it's in a negative way. But an eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Do you imagine Jesus can't say to the feet, I don't need you? Jesus can't say to you, I don't need you. Wow, what a commitment he made. No, much rather, the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God has composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it. So there is honor that's given by God, and there's honor that is accumulated. It's from God, but it's also supplied through man. And if what we are doing, it gets its perks also through man, then the honor of God will give is less. And if there's parts that we've been given that we're settled in, that we're doing, and nobody's noticing it, and we wonder sometimes, is it necessary? Does it, do, would it really matter if I wasn't here? Those are the ones that are receiving the greater glory and honor of God. Just have to learn to, to uh, receive it from God because it's not being given by man. That there should be no schisms or divisions in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Now, if we can, we, everybody's getting communion. We're going to do it in just a second. If you don't have, have uh, communion elements, please just uh, raise your hand if you give me mine. I'm going to go back to Romans 12 to close this as we pray. Thank you so much. It is my responsibility to hold myself in God's presence and accept his word as truth and believe that he is able to perform what he's promised and to hold a place of in his presence, I believe, in his presence. It's my responsibility to learn not to look with a, with a hard up vision on the circumstances and look with a focused glorification of the ability of God to perform and call life out of death. That's a, that I'm cultivating that. That's a, a secret place in the presence, and we, we grow it. And then it's my responsibility to love fervently and to love everyone around me and with the love of Christ. And he does it in a unique way. He says, we being many are one body in Christ, but we're individual members one of another, having the gifts differing according to the grace that's given us. So there's a grace that's been given to all of us so that we all are carrying gifts. And let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in the proportion of our faith. So here we list seven simple, what we call grace gifts or motivational gifts, things that kind of, we just, they were sewn into us and they, they're to manifest and bring about the, blood, the care of God's love inside his body. So prophecy, ministry or service, let us use it in our serving or ministry. So there's uh, exhortations to every gift and we'll get into more of that next week. He who teaches in teaching. So if we have something, it's now uh, like maintaining a place of faith and agreement with God in his spirit, in his word. I'm also to maintain a place of agreement with God in his in, uh, enabling me, gracing me to serve in a certain way and, and to not grow weary in that service. He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, we will start here next week, Lord willing. But I can, I'm going to tell on Cammie because she's not in the room. I, I have no fear. She's not here. <laughs> She'll hear me later. But Cammie's a mercy shower. 
Incidentally, most of the, 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 the body of Jesus Christ is filled with those who serve and those who show mercy. We just, we have such need of it. So he's all in there. And there's others, but, but, um, but it says the charge. Those who show mercy. Cammie can be in a room. She should be a perfect stranger. And they'll start telling her her life. And the reason they love to tell her her life is because she doesn't talk back to them. She doesn't advise them. She doesn't correct them. She empathizes. She feels. She can feel. Some of you, many of you, you feel. Oh, wow, that's terrible. I can't believe that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, but it's not like faithless, because you can see she charges. Mercy has a lot of faith. You're going to do it. We're going to, but it's different than about how you're going to get better for it. And, but I, but I watched her, and she'll be the first to admit it. What happens to a mercy shower when they've been mercied too much? They get to hell with you. Figure it out yourself. I'm done helping any of you stupid idiots who can't even find God yourself. Now, you'll never see that, but I have seen that. And she'll confess it. Because you're supposed to have, the gift has to flow in cheerfulness. Now here, we'll put the two together and we'll do communion. Jesus, in John 10, tells us the secret. He said, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my soul, my life, my suke, for the sheep. And then he says, God loves me because I lay down my soul for the sake of the sheep. He says, I have authority to take it up again. And no man can take it from me. So here's the stewardship that every believer I have to learn, and it's so hard. I, I, my gift starts working. I start l being drained. It goes from a giving to a taking. It goes from me joyfully serving to someone taking out of me what I, I don't even want to give anymore, and I don't know how to get out. And so I then usually just quit and disengage. Where Jesus said, no, I understand the principle that I am not to let someone take my life from me. But neither, but I came to give my life away. So what happens when my life's being taken from me? I need to disengage and re-engage with my father. I need to reconnect. I need to re-become back into the oneness and the union and the support and the life. Then I can go back and give again. It's the same, same thing in marriage. It's in any relationship. So here we have communion. Jesus held the room while he was in betrayal. Active betrayal was against him. He held the room that everyone lived in the atmosphere of his union with the Father. And in that place, he then broke and made covenant. And it wasn't a covenant made for the victors. It was a covenant made for the failures. Because that night, everyone would betray him. Everyone would flee from him. Everyone would walk away from him. Peter had to have it so ex exasperated because he was such a big mouth and full of pride and fear. But the everyone. So he takes the bread. Let's just, one moment. The room was filled with his presence. It's not till he gets to the garden does his soul have to start entering into the sacrifice he's been called to become. That's when he said, I'm at the point of death. I am more distressed than I've ever and could ever. Because he's feeling what's about to come to take place as his soul will be made an offering for sin. But in the room, he's still holding, holding the place. You know, John's on his bosom. <gasps> Peter has to kick him. Ask him who's going to betray you. Oh, hey, who you, who's going to betray you, Jesus? He says, the one I dipped the bread in. You know, it's, they, nobody knows anything because Jesus is holding the room. That's how we grow up. We can start holding rooms. When we're young, we, we, lose our, we lose our place. We lose our grace. We lose our happiness. But when we get older, we learn to find that, return to that place and refine that place. And that's what communion is. I want to prophesy to you and me that God himself has placed each of us in the body of Christ 
particularly as a member to cause the growth of the entire body of Christ inside love. And not one of us is disposable. And the head, Jesus, will not say to any of us, I can do it without you. He is not ashamed to call us his brethren, no matter how we're acting out or refusing to act. And yet, God the Father has made a promise to the Son. I will give you a perfect bride, made perfect in you, Son, by accepting what I have accomplished in you. And that perfect bride will be matured. She will walk in wholeness. She'll walk in completeness. And God the Father, who made a promise, is able to perform the promise. And that's what we're engaged in. You think you're in warfare because God's trying to, the devil's trying to take away your life? No, you're in warfare because God's displacing the old life to bring a new life. There's not the time of recovery. It's the time for resurrection. It's not the time to stop what's going bad and make it go back to what it was. It's stop what's going bad by declaring life to come to where the dead is. Letting life come out of the dead. Light shine. It's not to look in a mirror and see myself dis, dis, disheveled and my possibilities you know, have gone and the future's never. It's to look in a mirror and say, boy, it's going to be amazing to watch what God does to fulfill his promises in the state you're in. It's going to be amazing to watch God do this because he's able. See, all eyes on God's ability, all eyes on his faithfulness, all eyes on his provision, all eyes on the Son. Yes, some of us are going to act out. We're going to do stupid stuff. We're going to curse and tell a servant girl profanity to prove that we're not a disciple. We're going to act out because we thought we could be from ourselves. But then we return. That's what we hold today, is the returning. Body broken, blood poured, sins remitted. And at this moment, we are fully restored. No one can point to us, say, you can't be here. You have no right. Why did you? No, no, no. I'm fully in Christ. Right? And, and the brokenness of my life is resubmitted to the wholeness of Jesus. And I'm not eyes on me and my ability. I, it's just God's ability. Eyes on him. What he promised. Jesus paid for it. All promises are yes and amen. So if you take your bread, the body of Jesus, we are that body. Father, I want to now declare, as you've spoken to me the second time, that this living body of Jesus Christ here at this location, in this sanctuary, online, at home, later on viewing, that this living body, in the eating of the body of Christ, broken for us, will come into an encounter with Holy Spirit and the truth of God's Word and an activation of sanctification that's beyond anything we could do ourselves to enter into the glory of Jesus Christ. And that wherever we've been locked out of our future by the past, the past will surrender and bow its knee, and the new hope will rise in Christ and what God has accomplished in the Son. We worship you for this, Jesus. This is the covenant you made with us. Let's go ahead and eat together. Now the body, the blood was poured, if we can go ahead and get ready, the remission of sin. Every reason that can't happen was remitted. Every debt that has been incurred has been paid for. Every sin we've done has been undone. Every sin done against us has been undone. There is no power of sin anymore to perpetuate itself because the blood speaks better. The blood says forgiveness, righteousness, redemption. So as we drink, we call to our remembrance Jesus' death and the remission of our sin and the undoing of all sin so that we fully come alive again in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink.
Wow. You've been so good, so, so close. The Lord's coming in his presence. I can feel his Holy Spirit hovering over each of us to individually awaken us. To awaken us into the uniqueness of our identity. To bring us back into acceptance inside the beloved and beloved. I can feel the Lord's hovering over our chaos, our darkness, wherever we might feel ourselves bruised. It's not that the old hope wasn't right. We were in the ballpark. It just wasn't the way God would bring it about. So it's not that you have to give up a dream. You just have to hand the dream back to the dream maker and let him refashion the dream to be what it was meant to be when he first dreamed it himself. It's to allow the Lord to come in right now and go, you know, when you first said yes to me and I began to say, look and listen, lift up your eyes and see. You saw it from where you were and that was a good place to begin. Now I want you to see from where I am. And begin to speak into the impossibility. Say to the death, you will yield and resurrection will bring forth life. 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 The life will come forth out of the dead. Light will shine out of that place of darkness. Joy will be birthed again out of the place of mourning. Praise will erupt again from where depression has rested and held captive. I agree with God. I glorify his ability. All of us have to walk like Jesus. All of us have to be raised from the dead. All of us have to believe the Father's able. All of us get to agree to become matured, to be that bride like the Christ. Lord God, I ask one last thing before we worship. I ask that this week there will be a rekindling within us of hopes gifts, callings, and inheritances so that none of us will wonder where we are to begin to apply ourselves. We'll begin to know exactly how we're to live out love. And we'll start to love intentionally because we're in in experiencing that love. In the name of Jesus, if that's something you'd like to receive, just lift up your hand, say, yes, Lord, do it for me. I want it done. I want to be alive. I want you to awaken again. Let's just stand together for a moment. Let's worship for a few moments. I mean, there's so much can happen in these five minutes, and I'm sorry we took a while. You can blame that on Val because of her worship. Got me engaged in faith. No, no, it's not at all. But let this next five minutes change our future. I'll I'll call ahead to wherever you have to go eat and tell them to save a seat. Just let them come. I mean it. Dream with me. Sing with us. Praise together. Envision. He's able. He's able. He's able. Go ahead. Use your own voice. You're able. You're going to perform what you promise. You're going to bring fulfillment.
Father, we ask that you seal us with the Holy Spirit a promise, fellowshipping with us in truth, engaging intentionally into your presence, hearing your voice speaking life into us and calling those things that don't exist as though they do. We declare hope again, the new hope fits the moment of completion. We thank you that we've been given a place that's irreplaceable. And we now allow who we are to live and shine and love and give life. And where we have become drained, we know where we can be refreshed and renewed. And we receive refreshing and renewing from the presence of the Lord. And we declare that you are able to perform what you promise. 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 In Jesus' name, amen.